In this video, we're going to introduce you to the game-changing Project Arrow 2.0 EV. Something we've talked about in the past, now we got more. Project Arrow 2.0 is a groundbreaking project by the Automobile Parts Manufacturers Association, a Canadian organization that represents uh, auto parts manufacturers, as you might expect. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the past in uh, in a past episode about the first Project Arrow in the episode titled uh, Project Arrow, Will This One Fly? That was a bit of an homage to a Canadian bugaboo uh, from uh, days gone by back in the, I think it was the 60s. Um, Canada was building a, a jet fighter called Avro Arrow and uh, it was, I think it was already able to fly or was doing test flights or whatever, um, but it was looking pretty impressive. And then from pressure from abroad, mostly the US uh, caused our prime minister of the day, uh, his name forever to be, uh, <laughs> to be uh, said with scorn, uh, Diefenbaker, uh, canceled the project and even trashed uh, the examples that were made. It was a shame, and it's gone down in Canadian history as a bit of a, as a bit of a myth. Not a myth, but like a a, a big. Uh, I don't know how you'd say it. It's like a kind of a a thing that sticks in the craw of all Canadians that what we could have been but weren't. Now it may have been a crap airplane. We never really would know, but. It looked really good at the time, and I think it was ahead of its time, according to some of the reports uh, and movies I've read about uh, the Avro Arrow. But anyways, this particular project is a an automobile concept car. It's called uh, Project Arrow, now Project Arrow 2.0. The original Project Arrow was a, a collection of auto manufacturers, uh, about 60 of them, that... Uh, provided parts and knowledge and expertise, and they assembled uh, for about 20 million bucks, a grant provided by the province of Ontario and the, uh, and the government of Canada together. Uh, they built this demonstrator car, but it wasn't really a demonstrator car in terms of, hey, this is a whole car we could make and produce uh, uh, here in Canada. Uh, no, it was more about the parts that went into it. Remember, this is the Automobile Parts Manufacturers Association. And this particular vehicle was mostly aimed at showcasing individual pieces, parts, and the manufacturers that make them. Uh, the idea being uh, we could showcase that we could do those things here in Canada and that we could um, uh, provide those parts to industry. That $20 million investment uh, led to Project Arrow. Now that vehicle has been uh, put on the trade show circuit for the last year. Um, it's been the darling of the trade show circuit and apparently has led to upwards of $500 million in parts orders. Now, I imagine that's a per annum. So that's a, a pretty good, uh, a pretty good uh, return on investment, I would say. Um, the project was so successful that they've decided to do uh, 2.0. 2.0 is essentially the same idea. It's a bunch of parts manufacturers, probably many more than the original 60, um, will produce up to 20 vehicles this time. Uh, I haven't heard about the funding. I heard some dollar figures about 200 million uh, being tossed around. I don't think that that's coming from the, the government this time. I think that's actually being provided by the parts manufacturers. The first round, I think, was a who knows if this is going to work idea. So the government backed it to see what would happen. Um, and now, since it was successful and led to a lot of orders, um, I think the idea being that they can demonstrate more, uh, more technology in multiple vehicles. I understand they're supposed to be roughly the same vehicle, but with uh, different parts in each of them, I guess, to, I'm imagining to do something that is kind of like an uh, like an, an SUV, a sportier car, you know, a crossover, a sedan wagon kind of thing, but it would all be in the same themology. Um, 
but you know you'd be able to showcase different suspension systems different motors and drivetrains different bms uh different uh operating systems and infotainment systems as well as you know all the motors and gizmos and gadgets that are in any vehicle um there is of course all kinds of things in electric vehicles that are also common to to most uh combustion vehicles uh, they all have wheels they all have suspensions they all have brakes bodies frames uh air conditioning systems and seats and to be honest the vast majority of the vehicle is no different uh one of the the main themes with uh, electric vehicles though is that they are try they try to be lighter overall so if a vehicle would have made something out of carbon steel in the past they're going to try to opt for aluminum or some kind of composite that is going to be lighter uh, body panels are often aluminum now because it's much lighter um, the glass they seem to be going with more glass even though glass is fairly heavy um, i imagine actually, i actually have no idea why it's nice it's great love it but uh i imagine they're uh that's more of on the marketing side, the, the selling side of the vehicle. It's an interesting idea, and I think it's got a lot of legs. It, this EV will be showcasing all the technology that uh, will make this particular vehicle um, kind of groundbreaking. It's uh, kind of the latest technology is in there, the kind of things that might be in the latest, maybe the more high-end EVs. But also, I imagine there's going to be ones that are budget conscious aimed at getting that vehicle price down um, sort of a mass-produced common element kind of uh, product so any ev could use x you know or if you do this you could lower your overall cost by x you know that kind of thing so that uh, auto manufacturers can start putting out those lower cost evs that people are demanding that's kind of feeding into this scenario we're hearing more about now, where they are talking about um, kind of EVs piling up. That was on a previous episode as well. The reality is that they're not piling up. They're selling a bit slower uh, than they were, but they're still accelerating in uptake. The The thing is, the, the vehicles are um, now being produced in greater numbers, so you're actually having them on lots without being sold so that is creating that piling up uh, phenomenon it's only piling up if you think having three or four evs on a lot with you know 150 ice cars is piling up but people say piling up so i said piling up i don't agree um, i think uh, the key for eliminating that um, sort of what, what is a bit more distressing is that the sales numbers for an EV are running a bit longer uh, in some areas, not in all, by any means not in all, in some areas is running a bit longer than their ICE equivalents. But from what I'm gathering, that's mostly in areas of low EV adoption. In areas of higher EV adoption, it, they are exceeding uh, ICE cars. So you know, pick and choose what you, what you want to talk about. If you like what you've seen so far, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button. It tells the algorithm that people like you like what we do, and it helps me out. But um, to sort of bring that around full circle is projects like Aero will demonstrate, you know, higher performance, luxury, sporty, off-road, uh, more expensive, and cheaper ideas. All that can be incorporated into these designs. I really hope to see at least a couple of those 20 designs being mass market low cost uh evs that can be adopted by you know the average middle class person um right now we have a real problem with uh lower middle and middle middle uh class ev update uptake um, when they look at a gas car and an ev and the ev is 25 30 percent 40 percent more 50 percent more than an equivalent gas car, that starts to eat into the potential savings and maintenance and fuel, right? Um, we need to see that get down to a more normalized number. As production increases in Canada, we're looking at hitting 13 to 14% uh, uh, sales of EVs in the third quarter. 
Thank you, Electric Autonomy, for passing that on. Uh, that was an S&P, uh, I think, report that they covered. Um, that kind of volume will allow them to buy parts at much, much lower cost than they were when they were selling, you know, one to four percent. Um, and that curve is ramping up each time they can increase production, each time they can lower costs another notch that opens up the market to another swath of buyers and we can accelerate and accelerate and accelerate. Um, lastly, this feeds into the whole uh, ecosystem that they're trying to create in the Canadian uh, economy. Uh, basically, we can create EVs from the ground, literally mining the resources out of the earth uh, to rolling them off the assembly line and putting them in your driveway. Um, Canada has many of the critical materials required for EVs. Canada has the knowledge and tradition of, of make, turning those uh, raw materials into um, not finished goods, but um, processed uh, materials into something that can be used by industry to make like body panels and batteries and whatever. Um, we can do those things. And then we also have a tradition of um, of you know making automobiles. We've been doing that in the auto pact for decades and decades and decades and decades, working in conjunction with the U.S. and other nations to produce automobiles through our parts suppliers and our finished manufacturing plants. So I think there's a good opportunity for the for the country of Canada. We've signed numerous battery deals. We've started exploration and preliminary mining for a lot of critical resources. Um, we have started opening up processing plants to turn those resources into finished goods, uh, not ship them you know, elsewhere to be finished and then brought back. That's a lot of jobs for the Canadian economy and jobs that will touch basically every province and territory. I think that's a good thing and I think it's uh, gearing Canada up for the future. I know other countries are doing similar things, particularly in uh, the resource extraction sector and somewhat in the in the production sector as well. Uh, it's good to see. Um, it's good to see that happening. It's good to see the supplier base uh, catching up. They there are some things that need to be done. We need to get the cost of those EVs down. We need people to be able to to purchase an EV, to make that choice on the dealer lot, um, to have EVs, I've been saying here for years, they say piling up, I say we're finally where we need to be, to be able to walk on to your vehicle manufacturer of choice, you name it, and look at, you know, I need to buy a new car and say, what do you got? I want a sedan, I want a crossover, I want an SUV, I want a van, whatever is your, whatever is your particular vehicle of choice. And to be able to look at what's on the lot and drive away with what you want. Not have to order it and wait six months for the thing to come in, or a year in my case, for the thing to come in. Just to be able to go, say, oh, you know, I wanted a blue one, but I'll take the white one. We'll, we'll buy that one. That is the holy grail. Leaving it up to the individual to make that choice on the lot at that time not being forced to buy it, but just to make that choice. Many people will make that choice. If they can afford to buy the vehicle, it will be cheaper to operate, it will be cheaper to fuel, and you're gonna be a lot better off, and the environment will be a lot better off. Preachy, isn't it? Sorry, don't mean to sound preachy, that's not the goal here. But I do want people to have those choices, and I want them to be solid choices that they can be proud of. Thank you for listening, have a great day. We'll see you again in a week.